Testing. 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 All right, we're live. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. We're going to get started in a second here. Uh, today we're going to be reading a paper, but I do have something interesting to report. So yesterday, uh, this guy, Sumit, on Twitter, published a tweet that was based on a podcast that George Hotz did where he mentioned that GPT-4 is not a single model. GPT-4 is, in fact, eight models. So GPT-4 is really an ensemble of eight models, each of which is roughly 220 billion parameters. And they're all probably slightly different in terms of what they're fine-tuned on. So... This is relatively big, you know, uh, not a lot of people are necessarily talking about it, but I think it might become big news because this is actually, it makes a ton of sense, right? So this uh, strategy of using multiple models to improve your final performance is sometimes called model ensembling or a mixture model. And it's actually very popular in Kaggle competitions. So in Kaggle competitions where you're really just trying to squeeze out that very last 1%, 2%. A lot of times people will basically train many different versions of the same model on slightly different subsets of the data. And then there will be a little bit more variety in the final output of these models given the same input. And then you can look at all the different outputs that those eight different models created. And generally picking the best out of those eight outputs is better than, than just using the output of one model that is quote unquote the best right so one that explains the performance of gpt4 the other thing that this explains is it explains the uh the constant talking of sam altman as to the inference cost so every, pretty much every opportunity he gets he's always talking about how it's so expensive to do inference and why would it be so expensive well one reason it could be so expensive is that much like george hotz is saying here they actually do 16 inferences so Whenever you go into Palm, right? Good old Google's Palm here. Palm.google.ai, or I think it's bar.google. But, oh shit. My keyboard is, my fingers are not warmed up. Bar.google.com. Yeah, whenever you go here and you type something and you hit enter, they're doing inference on just one model, right? Whenever you go on GPT-4 and do something, if what is being said here is correct, they're basically doing 16 inferences, right? So what you see here is really the result of 16 different models and then probably some kind of value function type model that picks the best out of those. So it's basically 16 times more expensive for OpenAI to do inference than for BART to do it, just based on what we've heard here. So that's the other uh, kind of piece of evidence. So first piece of evidence, it's very popular on Kaggle. Second piece of evidence, uh, it makes sense given the narrative that they have around the inference cost. And then the third piece of evidence that I have to support this uh, claim, which is groundbreaking if it's true here, is that if you actually go into this paper, hello Riddell, we're uncovering the uh, GPT-4 conspiracy theory here. But if you actually go into the 2021 paper for Codex, right? This is a OpenAI paper. You got Ilya on here. You got Wojcik. Um, if you actually scroll and you read this paper, which I, I don't know if we read it. I, I might have read this before I even had the YouTube channel, but they do this exact same thing. You see here. Uh, we use Codex 12B to generate 100 samples per token. So they already had this strategy of hey, in order to solve one of these little leak code problems, let's generate 100 solutions and then filter them down, right? And then here they even refer to 
we fine-tune codecs on these training problems to produce a set of supervised fine-tuned models, which we call codex S. A set of codex models. So, if they were already doing this kind of like uh, strategy for codex, they probably did that for GPT as well, especially given the timing of this paper, right? This is a 2021 paper. So I don't know, that's that's just something that kind of has gotten me thinking about, it makes, it kind of puts everything into context and it, I feel like it explains a lot of what we've seen with this just kind of random jump in performance that ChatGPT had and then all the kind of hype that came out of that. I think that we're finally understanding what it is that they did and really all they did is they basically made a ensemble. They made eight models that are slightly different and then those eight models are masquerading as a single model. So I don't know, just, just a little uh, something to think about. But the main course for today is going to be this paper, Self-Supervised Learning from Images with a Joint Embedding Predictive Architecture. This is a paper out of a couple different groups here, mostly uh, Meta AI, obviously Facebook AI Research, with famously Jan LeCun there, uh, you got Mila in Quebec, you got McGill, so a couple Canadian universities here, and then you got New York University. Um, all right, let's get to it. This is relatively, seems like ancient paper at this point. They're 13th of April, but I think it's uh, coming back up because it's uh, CVPR is this week. So this is the official conference that they submitted this to. Uh, this paper demonstrates an approach for learning highly semantic image representations. Highly semantic image representations. So image representations are a vector of numbers, right, that represent an image, right, also called embeddings. Um, highly semantic just refers to the fact that those embeddings are in some way forced to represent the content of an image and not necessarily the texture or the color or the visual appearance of the image. So there's going to be some kind of fancy uh, either regularization or technique or specific way that they train this such that the image representations that you get are highly semantic. Uh, without relying on handcrafted data augmentation, so data augmentation is whenever you uh, basically mess with the visual appearance of an image in order to uh, generate a larger training distribution. Uh, Every single data augmentation is handcrafted. I think there's a, there's a very few amounts of, there's very few data augmentations that aren't handcrafted. Pretty much all of them are handcrafted, like left, right flipping, cropping, corruption, even just, even a Gaussian blur is handcrafted because someone had to decide what Gaussian to blur the image with. So I think the only data augmentations that aren't handcrafted are, uh, kind of the adversarial ones where you use a net to style transfer an image kind of thing, but. Okay, we introduced the image-based joint embedding predictive architecture. That's the full explanation of the uh, acronym there. A non-generative approach. So non-generative approach, there's no generative model here, probably no diffusion model is I guess what they're teasing here. Self-supervised learning, so learning uh, that is supervised means that you have basically for every single input image you have a uh, target, right? So for example, you have an image, you might have a class or a bounding box or a segmentation. That's supervised learning. Self-supervised learning is where you don't need that target. So usually this is some kind of masked task where you basically maybe cut out a piece of the image and then try to reconstruct that missing piece. So self-supervised is some formulated training task that doesn't require explicit labeling. Uh, from images. The idea behind iJabba is symbol, simple. From a single context block, predict the representations of various target blocks in the same image. Okay. So the self-supervision here is that this is the input, the context block. We don't know exactly what that is, probably just a chunk of the image, and then predict the representations of various target blocks. So given a Chunk of the image, predict the representation. A core design choice is to guide towards producing semantic representations is the masking strategy. Okay, so 
there we there you go they're letting you know that this is basically going to be some kind of masking type self-supervised learning which is pretty par for the course uh, crucial to sample target blocks with sufficiently large scale and to B use a sufficiently informative spatially distributed context block Okay, so we don't really know exactly what they mean there, but that seems like it's the meat of the paper, so they'll explain it for sure. Uh, when combined with a vision transformer, a vision transformer, also called a VIT, is basically a transformer that uh, is used as a vision encoder. It basically breaks up an image into these little chunks and then feeds each of those chunks as if they were a sequence or basically a sentence into a transformer, which then does your standard attention blocks and so on. Uh, for instance, we train a VIT Huge 14 on ImageNet using 16 A100 GPUs in under 72 hours. Okay. So, let me put the color, correct color there. I think we use red or blue for, not green, blue. VIT is a vision transformer. VIT huge is the size of the vision transformer. There's different sizes of sizes of vision transformers. You have small ones, big ones, large ones, and so on. It's just the number of parameters. 14 is the the number of patches in the vision transformer. So 14 means that it's a 14 patch vision transformer. Uh, obviously, the memory footprint of a transformer depends on the size of the sequence so the number of image patches is effectively the size of the sequence so the more patches the more compute and memory you're going to need for a vision transformer ImageNet is basically just a data set it's just a bunch of images but they also have uh classes so i think there's like ImageNet 1k for example has 1000 uh classes with, I don't know, things like dog, cat, chair, uh, about, home. They really don't have a single picture of this. That's kind of annoying. Let's see if Google Images has a better picture. Yeah, this is what ImageNet 1K looks like. You have vehicle, craft, watercraft. So 1,000 different categories. People use it as a benchmark for zero shot transfer learning so a lot of times in these kind of self-supervised uh image uh papers they'll basically train on some giant data set and then they'll basically see how good the the pre-trained model is at something like ImageNet classification but here it actually seems like they train it directly on ImageNet so you certainly couldn't do zero shot evaluation of that uh, to achieve strong downstream performance across a wide range of tasks from linear classification to object counting and depth prediction. So these are different uh, tasks that you can do with images, right? Linear classification is basically this task of like giving an image, tell me what the class is, right? Classification is about finding the class related to an image. Uh, object counting is basically bounding boxes, but then counting the number of instances of those bounding boxes. And then depth prediction is creating a depth image. All right, so that's the abstract. Uh, we got here the figure, ImageNet linear evaluation. The iJEPA method learns semantic image representations without using any view data augmentations during pre-training. Okay, so they're really talking about this semantic image representations. All image representations are semantic in some way, right? It's like the semanticness of an image representation is not something that's easy to measure. So that no doesn't necessarily have any gravitas here when they use the word semantic, but I think their technique is all about saying that because of all this stuff that they're going to do here with the cropping and, and whatever they're, they're going to end up doing, the, the the image representations that they're going to get are going to be more semantic than normal. Uh, without using any view data augmentations, by predicting in representation space, iJEPA produces semantic representations while using less compute than previous methods. Okay, so something that they're kind of teasing here is that a lot of times when you're doing these self-supervised uh, vision encoders, you mask out a part of the image and then you predict the missing part of the image, but you're predicting in image space, right? So given a chunk missing of the image, you predict the missing part of the image, but you're basically going from image space all the way back to image space. It sounds like here, they might be saving on compute 
by predicting in a representation space rather than an image space. And this this is a concept that is also used in diffusion models. In diffusion models, they also, uh, for example, do diffusion in a latent space or in a representation space as opposed to doing diffusion in the actual image space. So maybe this is kind of the TLDR of this entire paper will be, hey, if you basically do self-supervised learning in representation space, it's actually a lot cheaper and it works better. So, okay, so we have an XY axis here. Uh, on the Y axis, we have top 1% which is a top 1% accuracy, which is basically a classification task. We have pre-training GPU hours, so this is a log scale as well here. You see how uh, it goes by powers of 10. Uh, we have different points here. These represent different uh, models here. So they're comparing against different... Uh, this is actually not even models. This, these are the models here. These are the vision encoders down here. These are different models, but here you have the uh, technique. So MAE, for example, is masked autoencoding. And then this number here, this 300 EP, that means 300 episodes, which basically means how many times did the uh, model see the data set. So here they're saying ImageNet. So how many times did you feed ImageNet into this model during training? So this one, for example, saw ImageNet 1,600 times. So every single image in ImageNet, 1,600 times. Here, iJEPA, way less than that, right? You're talking 300 episodes. So not only does it use less episodes and a uh, less pre-training hours, right? But it's also higher performance. But note here that the the performance axis isn't perfect right it's not from zero it goes from 76 to 82 so even though it seems like it's a big jump really you're going you're talking about 78 to 79 so it's not necessarily a huge performance jump okay uh let's get into this introduction here there are two common families of approaches for self-supervised learning, invariance-based methods and generative methods. Okay, a lot of, a lot of references there. Invariance-based pre-training methods optimize an encoder to produce similar embeddings for two or more views of the same image. So, views here, I think, means maybe augmented versions of the image, right? So basically you have an image, you augment it, right, with some handcrafted data augmentation, so just scaling, cropping, color jittering, and you get a representation, and then you take that same image and do a different data augmentation, get a slightly different representation, and then you say, okay, well, actually, both of these representations should actually be the same, because both of these images that I gave you are actually the same image, semantically, they just have a different visual appearance because of the data augmentation that I applied to them. Uh, these training, training methods can produce representations of a high semantic level, but they also introduce strong biases that may be detrimental for certain downstream tasks or even for pre-training tasks with different data distributions. Okay, so kind of what they're saying here is that the representations that you get from this type of invariance-based pre-training, they are highly semantic because you're basically making your model very robust to these different types of data augmentation, such as scaling, cropping, and color jittering. But because you're taking your uh, data distribution and uh, adding this data augmentation, you're kind of putting a bias into what your model is trained on, right? Your model is at now very sensitive to scaling and flipping and cropping and color jittering. And that might not be necessarily good if you then try to take that... Uh, pre-trained uh, image encoder and use it in a uh, different data distribution that is maybe weird. I don't know, maybe something like an MRI image or depth image or something like that. It is unclear how to generalize these biases for tasks requiring different levels of abstraction. Image classification and instance segmentation do not require the same invariances. Additionally, it is not straightforward to generalize these image-specific augmentations to other modalities such as audio. Image classification is the easiest thing to do uh, data augmentation for because for just any, you can take this picture of a of a dog and you can uh, you can change, flip it left to right, it's still a dog. But 
uh, instance segmentation is a little bit more complicated, right? There's type there's augmentation techniques that will work for instance segmentation, but not for image classification and vice versa, right? And it's, especially if you're doing like kind of fancy cropping and shifting like that, that's going to be a pain for uh, instance segmentation, where usually you have to basically uh, then also crop and scale the masks and bounding boxes. Cognitive learning theories have suggested that the driving mechanism behind representation learning in biological systems is the adaptation of an internal model to predict sensory input responses. So this is kind of a model-based RL uh, here. Basically, a lot of people think that what's happening in your brain is your brain is creating a model of reality, and then basically your brain is constantly looking at the model of reality that it's predicting and then the sensory information that's coming in it's producing some error and then that error is used to adjust the internal model of reality so the brain doesn't do back propagation it basically does this like weird error adjusting uh, this idea is at the core of self-supervised generative methods which remove the corrupt portions of the input and learn how to predict the corrupted content right so this masking yeah, in particular, mask denoising approaches learn representation by reconstructing randomly masked patches from an input. This is very popular. I feel like every other paper from um, Facebook AI research that involves pre-training uh, image models is basically some variant of masking. Mask pre-training tasks require less prior knowledge than view and variance approaches and easily generalize beyond the image modality. Uh, I don't know about these claims, right? I think generalization is very difficult to quantify, so saying something easily generalizes versus difficultly, difficultly generalizes, I don't know if you can make a strong statement there. However, resulting representations are typically of a lower semantic level and underperform invariance level pre-training and off-the-shelf evaluations. Yeah, so the problem with this masking task, right, is that the 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 net the loss is based on perfectly reconstructing in image space right and because you have to perfectly reconstruct in image space these missing patches that you masked out let me actually get a picture of this max uh, patches uh, image pre-training yeah so something like this right uh, in this uh, masked autoencoder so MAE and actually, if you go into the paper, that's this one here, MAE right here with a VITH14. So you see in this type of task, you basically are masking out parts of the image. You see how some of these are masked out and you know what this image is, right? So this is the kind of self-supervised aspect of this is that you don't need to pay scale AI to label this image for you in order to do supervised learning. You can self-supervise, you can supervise yourself because you actually know what this image is. So you can see here how basically they're feeding these patches into an encoder and then trying to get the decoder to uh, predict the missing patches. But this prediction has to reconstruct the actual image. So what ends up happening is that the model ends up using a lot of its capacity, a lot of its kind of energy, uh, a lot of its chi. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word there, but it uses a lot of its energy in trying to, to, to really get the texture right. You know, get the texture, get the edges correct, get the appearance right, you know? And what they're trying to argue in this paper is that that's not actually necessarily good, right? You don't want uh, low semantic, right? Low semantic as in like something that doesn't care about the fact that this is a flamingo. What it really cares about is getting this exact color of pink, you know? So that's, they're making a distinction here between high semant highly semantic things where it's more about the high level what's in the actual image this image is an image of a flamingo versus low semantic things which is basically i just need to get this exact color right i need to get the texture of this thing right and so on uh underperform invariance based pre-training and off-the-shelf evaluations and in transfer settings with limited supervision for semantic classification tasks Consequently, a more involved adaptation mechanism and to end fine tuning is required to reap the full advantage of these methods. Okay, so basically a lot of times when people will do these uh, pre-trained models, they'll end up fine tuning them for some specific task. 
Uh, in this work, we explore how to pro improve the semantic level of self-supervised representation without using extra prior knowledge encoded through image transformations. So here they're basically kind of throwing a little bit of shade toward data augmentations because they're saying that things like scaling, cropping, and color jittering are basically a way of encoding a prior knowledge into the task, right? So as a human, I know that if I have a picture of a flamingo and I flip it left to right, it's still a picture of a flamingo, right? So there's an invariance to left and right flipping that I know is a reality and I'm going to basically uh, put that prior knowledge into this self-supervised task through a data augmentation. And here they're basically kind of saying that, hey, you don't necessarily want to put in those priors, right? The kind of gold standard for uh, machine learning is some technique that has zero priors but somehow learns everything perfectly. Uh, to that end, we introduce a joint embedding predictive architecture. So I think what we're going to be seeing here is something that predicts embeddings. I think all the, it's going to be, my guess is this is basically going to be a masked uh, prediction task, but in the uh, latent or embedding space. Uh, an illustration of the method, the idea behind iJEPA is to predict missing information in an abstract representation space. Yep. Given a single context block, predict the representations of various target blocks in the same image where target representations are computed by a learned target encoder network. Okay, so you, you're going to have a couple different pieces here, I think, which is kind of what they're showing here. You're going to have a couple different encoders and decoders. Right, seems like they actually might even have multiple encoders, multiple decoders. Hopefully it's not too many because if you have too many, it can start to get pretty complicated. Compared to generative methods that predict in pixel and token space, iJEPA makes use of an abstract prediction targets which unnecessary, which of which unnecessary pixel level details are potentially eliminated. Right, they don't want to use any of the model capacity for uh, learning these kind of pixel level details, right, such as uh, the texture of this flamingo, the color of the flamingo, this exact, the way that this edge between the black background and the flamingo uh, uh, feathers are. So they don't want to waste any of the representational capacity of the model on that. They want the representational capacity of the model to be focused entirely on the high level semantics. Uh, thereby leading the model to learn more semantic features. Another core design choice is to guide iJEPA towards producing semantic representations in the proposed multi-block masking strategy. Uh, specifically, we demonstrate the importance of predicting sufficiently large target blocks in the image. Okay, so I think what they're referring to here is the size of the blocks that you mask out. Right? I think if you mask out small blocks, it's you're going to get a different effect than if you mask out big blocks. But we've already seen this from them. I think there was another paper that we read uh, from Meta AI Research. I don't remember if it was them, but where basically they were playing around with the size of the blocks. In the paper that, uh, let me actually go to the channel and see which paper it was. Uh, I think it was this one, yeah, Hiera. Yeah, so in this paper, this was another paper by uh, Facebook AI Research, right? Very, very similar kind of paper, but they played with the size of these uh, blocks that you're using when you're masking in these self-supervised tasks. And But the reason they were doing it in this paper is because they uh, were doing it for efficiency, right? So basically they were picking very, very carefully the size of these uh, blocks and the masks such that the uh, attention mechanisms and the way that the GPU calculates or not calculates but the GPU does training and you get these gradients so that it basically works out perfectly you don't have any padding you don't have any extra uh, any extra compute wasted basically but here they're doing it for the purpose of creating a representation that is more semantic. Uh, okay, through an extensive empirical evaluation, we demonstrate that iJEPA learns strong off-the-shelf representations without the use of handcrafted view augmentations. 
iJEPA performs pixel reconstruction methods such as MAE on ImageNet 1K, linear probing, semi-supervised 1% ImageNet 1K, and semantic transfer task. So basically it seems like they're going to evaluate on a bunch of different uh, ImageNet variants. ImageNet is a good benchmark. I think it's kind of running to the end of its life. I feel like the performance is starting to become too good. You know, if, if the benchmark is too easy, then you start to overfit. So I feel like maybe they should have picked a more challenging benchmark here. iJEPA is competitive with view invariant pre-training approaches on semantic tasks and achieves better performance on low-level vision tasks such as object counting and depth prediction. By using a simple model with less rigid inductive bias, iJEPA is applicable to a wider set of tasks. I think here this is another uh, jab at the uh, handcrafted data augmentations, right? Uh, iJEPA also scalable and efficient. Pre-training of VITH on ImageNet requires less than 1,200 GPU hours. I like how that's considered efficient. <laughs> which is over two times faster than a VITS-16 pre-trained with iBot. Uh, these aren't even the same size VIT, so I don't know how this is even comparable. But I guess VITS is smaller, with over 10 times more efficient than VITH-14 pre-trained with MIE. Okay, this is more, this is more comparable. Predicting representation space significantly reduces the total computation needed for self-supervised training. Yeah, this sentence here is huge, which is the reason that uh, you see this uh, generation in representation space, right? Diffusion in latent space. And here, they're doing the same thing, that same concept of, hey, if you do things in these low dimensional representation spaces, it's going to be way faster in terms of computation and memory and training. So it seems like basically now that's... That's what they're going to do. They're going to take all their MAE work that they did, all this self-supervised MAE, and then they're basically going to do it in the latent space or representation space. Uh, all right, so they put the background section right here. Let's actually go and read this. Look at this figure here. Common architectures for self-supervised learning in which the system learns to capture relationships between its inputs. Okay, all right, this makes more sense. I thought this was three things talking about the technique in this paper, but this is just comparing three different techniques, so actually that makes more sense. Uh, this objective is to assign a high-energy, large-scalar value to incompatible inputs and to assign a low-energy, low-scalar value to compatible inputs. Okay, joint embedding architectures learn to output similar embeddings for compatible inputs X and Y. So you have X, you have Y, feeding both of those into an encoder, you're getting some x, some S, sx, some sy, basically two vectors here, and you have some kind of distance between those vectors. Okay, so you're trying to get these x encoder and the y encoder to basically produce the same vector or vectors that are closer if these x and y are closer semantically, and then get these two vectors here, these two embeddings, SX and XY, to be more further apart if X and Y are uh, less semantically similar. Okay, so that's joint embedding architectures. Generative architectures learn to directly reconstruct a signal Y from a compatible signal X using a decoder network that is conditioned on an additionally possibly latent variable Z to facilitate reconstruction. Okay, so uh, this joint embedding architecture what would it actually look like in practice? What it would actually look like in practice is maybe you take an image of a cat here in this X, and you take an image of a cat, and but then you flip it left and right, and you add a Gaussian blur to it, and you change the color a little bit, and you feed each of those two different images, which semantically are the same thing. It's the same picture of the cat, but visually they look very different now. You generate embeddings, and then you basically want to pull those together. And then you do the same thing, but with a picture of a cat and a dog, and you push those apart, and that's how you get that's what's going on here. In the generative architecture, you're taking the image of the cat, you're encoding it into some kind of vector, and then you're decoding it back into the image of the cat. And then you're saying, okay, well, the image of the cat, after it goes through this encoder and then the decoder, should actually be the same as the image of the cat, right? So you see here, now you're basically doing a distance metric 
but your distance metric is not in uh, a representation space as it is here, and now the distance metric is in uh, image space, right? It's in Y, the image space. So this is going to be more expensive. So because you have to do this extra decoder step, this the inference here is going to take longer. There's this is going to be a bigger model, and this distance metric here is going to also be more expensive to compute because this is an image space. And here, this Z here basically means that you can condition this decoder on a class label, a noise, whatever the fuck you want, right? The Z can be anything. Uh, joint embedding predictive architecture. Okay, so C is basically the combination of both these things. You see where you are taking the image, you're encoding it, you're decoding it, or not, not even decoding it here, you're encoding it, then you are have a model which given the, the, the uh, SX here, is going to predict SY, and then you have the distance metric in SY. So you see here, this distance metric and this distance metric are in latent spaces, or embedding spaces, or representation spaces. Any of those words work. So these are going to be cheaper, versus the uh, distance metric here is in image space, so this is expensive. But I guess the problem with this is now you have a lot more models, right? You, not, you need to encode the input, you need to encode Y, and you also need to do this prediction. So, I don't know, it kind of looks like potentially you're going to spend a bunch more time doing uh, pushing uh, inputs through these different model parts here. Uh, generative architectures learn to reconstruct a signal Y from a compatible signal X using a decoder network. Uh, joint embedding predictive architectures learn to predict the embeddings of a signal Y from a compatible signal X using a predictor network that is conditioned on additional possibly latent variable Z to facilitate prediction. You know, I kind of like this uh, this little figure because I think that this is kind of a high level. They don't they they say for example signal Y right? They they they're being generic here. They're not they're not directly saying hey X is an image Y is an image. They're basically uh, showing this to you in a generic high level way where X can be anything. X can be audio, X can be uh, image, X can be text. So this separation of different self-supervised uh, learning techniques is actually uh, modality agnostic. So I like that they did that. They could have very easily just done this specifically for images, but they decided that, hey, let's make this figure in a way that it also applies to other modalities. All right, let's get into this background section here. Uh, background, self-supervised learning is an approach to representation learning in which the system learns to capture the relationship between its inputs. This objective can be readily described using the framework of energy-based models, okay, EBMs, in which the self-supervised objective is to assign a high energy to incompatible inputs and to assign a low energy to incompatible input, to compatible inputs. So energy is not, like a formal, there isn't one definition of energy, right? If you talk to a physics person, there's a different, there's one definition for energy. If you talk to a biology person, different definition of energy. If you talk to, there's, there's a lot of definitions of energy, a lot of different meanings of the word energy, but generally uh, energy refers to complexity or high distance in this case, right? So let's actually see. Energy based models Eli 5. New chat. Uh, many existing generative and non generative approaches to self supervised learning can indeed be cast in this framework. Is this an old Jan LeCun reference? Is that why he put that in there? Yeah. <laughs> You gotta love the the pettiness of Lacoon here. <laughs> this is so he's the first name on here, so this is his paper, right? So there you go. In the related work section, he ties it back to some of his original work here with EBMs, right? So this is kind of like a uh, very Schmidt Hubery, if I have to say. So Schmidt Huber is a guy who is known for this, where basically Anytime somebody comes up with a new technique, he figures out some way to argue that secretly the technique is really just a renamed version of one of his earlier techniques, 
right? And I feel like Jan LeCun has a little bit of that tendency as well, where uh, he will say, hey, this new technique that people are doing, actually, here's a paper that I did 20 years ago where I did the same thing. I just called it something else, you know? So that kind of makes uh, paints a little picture here about what exactly EBM is. Uh, ball rolling down a hill. Uh, probability distribution of a data set. Imagine you have a bunch of Legos. You can use it, energy-based models, blah, blah, blah. What? This doesn't even make sense. Huh. I think this is more... The lower the energy of a state, the more likely it is to occur. I think that's that's a better kind of intuition building statement. Think about a big party where you're trying to predict who will become friends with whom. The trampoline surface represents the energy function of our EBM. People that are already friends will tend to group together, creating a deep dip in the trampoline surface. These dips are low energy states. They represent configurations that are very likely. So if you see two people bouncing around, you can predict they are or will be friends. Okay, so this is more uh, making the case that the distance in some latent space, aka the trampoline, is... Uh, effectively energy so points that are closer together in this latent or representation space have low energy so in this case energy i guess is basically the distance between two things so here if sx and sy if this d this distance function between those two uh, vectors is a very big value that's high energy if it's a very small value it's low energy okay Joint embedding architectures. Invariance-based pre-training can be cast in the framework of EBMs using joint embedding architecture, which learns to output similar embeddings for compatible inputs X and Y, and distance embedding, dissimilar embeddings or distant embeddings for incompatible inputs. This is the kind of fundamental pull things together that are similar and then push things apart that are different. In the context of image-based pre-training, compatible XY pairs are typically constructed by randomly applying handcrafted data augmentations to the same input image. Yeah, which is basically what they were kind of poo-pooing earlier here with the uh, pr uh, using extra prior knowledge encoded through image transformations, right? That is what's happening here, right? Where you basically construct these pairs of uh, images that should basically have the same semantic representation because the handcrafted data augmentation preserves semantic meaning. The main challenge with joint embedding architectures is the representation collapse, wherein the energy landscape is flat, i.e. the encoder produces an output, constant output regardless of the input. I think this is the best way to think about collapse. So model collapse is something that we've run into before on some papers. And it's basically one way to think about it is that you have a model and you're feeding it something and it produces some output. And then if the model starts producing the same output, regardless of what you feed it, then that model has collapsed, right? So if you have a model that supposedly uh, tells cats and dogs apart and you feed it a picture of a cat and it says cat, and then you feed it a picture of a trampoline and it says cat, and then you feed it a picture of a basketball and it says cat, then you can probably safely assume that the that model has basically collapsed. Uh, during the past few years, several approaches have been investigated to prevent representational collapse, such as contrastive losses that explicitly push apart embeddings of negative examples, and non-contrastive losses that minimize the informational redundancy across the embeddings. Okay. Uh, Clustering-based approaches that minimize that maximize the entropy of the average embeddings. So a couple different techniques there to prevent representational collapse. There are also heuristic approaches. Found the stream searching for iJeba content. 07 Jeba is definitely crazy. Wanted to train a model and test it out here in a couple days. Thanks for joining the stream, Creative Builds. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. There are also heuristic approaches that leverage an asymmetric architectural design. 
between the X encoder and the Y encoder to avoid collapse. Okay, so that's kind of interesting where you can mess with this X encoder and the Y encoder such that it becomes more difficult for this distance uh, metric which is used as the loss, right, and is basically what's pushing the gradients into these encoders. So if you use different architectures for these, you're less likely to get a mode collapse. Uh, should we look at this figure? Let's actually finish this background section and then we'll look at this figure. Generative architectures. Reconstruction-based methods for self-supervised learning can also be cast in the frameworks of EBMs. Yeah, so this is kind of what I'm referring to, where it's like Jan LeCun has this way of thinking about things using energy, right? Or what he thinks about when he thinks about energy in his head. And basically, <laughs> he's kind of like, in the related work section, he's going through all these different uh, self-supervised techniques here and then kind of trying to make the point that secretly all of those are based around this energy-based model idea. Because, of course, every single good idea has to come from him. And mo a lot of kind of academics think that way, so I'm not necessarily shitting on him just for that. But Are X and Y's different modalities like text and image, or are they both images with different types of encoding in the images? Uh, I think in this case, because the purpose of uh, this paper is to create a uh, pre-trained uh, image encoder, then yes, X and Y would be two images. But this technique uh, also works for different modalities. So if you know uh, clip, which is something that I talk about all the time, con uh, clip, contrastively trained language and image, you see here they're feeding text into the text encoder and then they're feeding image into the image encoder and then basically whatever comes out of those should be the same right so they're learning a joint embedding space for images and text right so clip is basically uh, a variant of this joint embedding architecture here except x is images and y is text but uh, in this paper they're they're mostly interested in creating a very strong image encoder so X is images and Y is also images. But yeah, you can do this with any modality, right? You could do this with, uh, for example, this generative architecture, you could you could feed it uh, audio and then get text and then basically say, okay, well, audio comes into this X encoder, then we have a decoder that turns whatever this little vector is here with some condition thing into uh, text, and then we compare that text to the text that it actually is, and then we do a difference there, right? So this figure is modality agnostic, which is why I actually like it. Uh, okay, generative architectures learn to directly reconstruct a signal Y from a compatible signal X. Yeah, and this is, the word compatible here is a little sneaky, right? Because earlier here, they're kind of talking about, oh, it's uh, these uh, uh less rigid inductive bias or extra prior knowledge encoded through image transformations, right? Like they're, they're kind of talking about priors as if they're kind of like a dirty word, right? They're like, you don't want any priors. But then here, they kind of sneak it in here that like, hey, actually there is a huge prior that we're putting in here. And the prior is that Y and X, right? The two inputs need to be compatible, right? At some point, a human had to decide, yes, this image corresponds to this text. Hey, this te image corresponds to this image, right? So that compatible there is really just a prior that you're putting in. So you have a JEPA space, which is like a world understanding model, and then you can train any type of encoder, encoder, even though the base model was trained only on images. Yeah, exactly. So. The idea with these type of pre-trained image encoders is that you basically get a very good representation space and then you can use that representation space for a downstream task such as classification or uh, depth prediction or maybe you want to train a nerf or something like that. Like, So having a very strong image encoder is just useful for a variety of tasks. Uh, okay, so you use Y and X, which are compatible, AKA they're paired, AKA there's some prior there that X and Y are compatible. You can also use some uh, latent or some other variable Z here. Maybe it's a class 
it's whatever you want it's basically just a vector uh, in the context of image-based pre-training one common approach is to produce compatible XY pairs using masking right this is the masking approach where X is a copy of the image Y but with some of the patches masked uh, where is it here so X and Y right so you know that X and Y are paired right you know that this image is this image because you masked it yourself and you have prior knowledge that if you mask an image it still retains that image right so there's th this is where the prior is coming from there's a there is a prior that's coming in whenever you're actually doing these masked tasks uh, the conditional variable Z then corresponds to a set of possibly learnable mask and position tokens that specify to the the decoder which image patches to reconstruct so I think in this paper they actually do do that so in this paper they're not actually feeding in the full every single patch so you see here how the encoder here is not receiving all these empty patches it's only receiving the patches that actually have data to it so at some point usually there's some kind of position embedding that's coming in here that's basically saying hey this patch corresponds to this position in the sequence or and that's what they're representing here with this Z right where there's some kind of maybe additional positional encoding it's going in representation collapse is not a concern with these architectures as long as the information capacity of Z is low compared to the signal of Y so I guess maybe what they're saying here is that if the amount of information that you're feeding into Z is really high then this model here this decoder might learn to just ignore this right so there's kind of like a balance here that you have to strike where this decoder has to the decoder is just really concerned about producing the best possible y hat right the the decoder wants to make the best possible y hat such that this loss is as small as possible so if it turns out that the z is actually much more useful for creating a really good y hat than whatever's coming out of this x encoder then over time the decoder is just going to learn to ignore what's coming in here right so there's this kind of like balancing act that you have to play where Z can't have too much information in it. And that's kind of what they're talking about here. As long as the informational capacity of Z is low compared to the signal Y. Joint embedding predictive architectures. As shown in figure 2C, joint embedding predictive architectures are conceptually similar to generative architectures. However, a key difference is that the loss function is applied in embedding space, not input space. Yeah, I think this is huge. I, like this pattern is exploding everywhere, right? This uh, do things in latent or embedding space rather than image space. JEP has learned to predict the embeddings of a signal Y from a compatible signal X using a prediction network that is conditioned on an additional possibly latent variable Z to pr facilitate prediction. Our proposed iJEPA provides uh, creative builds. So with the Z versus X, if the input image is super far off from the output image, the decoder will bias towards Z. Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's, Z could be anything here. It, there's going to be a lot of different ways of doing this. Z might be position encoding. Z might be, see how they, they don't actually, additional possibly latent variable Z. So Z might even be itself some kind of weird latent variable, like the output of a text encoder, right? So maybe Z could be the output of a text encoder, like right here, right? So this is just a very generic way to think about a generative uh, self-supervised learning so yeah it really depends on the the specifics of what your what is y in your case what is z in your case and what is x in your case uh, jeff has learned to predict the embeddings of a signal y from a compatible signal x using a predictor network that is conditioned on an additional possibly latent variable z to facilitate prediction uh, iJEPA provides an instantiation of this architecture in the context of images using masking. Yeah, so, okay. Basically, iJEPA is going to be a joint embedding predictive architecture, is what they're telling you. Uh, do not seek representations invariant to a set of handcrafted data augmentations, but instead seek representations that are predictive of each other when conditioned on additional information Z. However, as with joint embedding architectures, representational collapse is also a concern with JEPAs. We leverage an asymmetrical architecture between X and Y encoders to avoid representation collapse. I think representation collapse is always going to happen anytime you have multiple networks that are kind of competing with each other. So representational collapse 
is also a huge problem in GANs, generative adversarial networks, where basically you have this generator network and the discriminator network kind of like fighting each other. And I think anytime you have a system where you have multiple encoders, multiple decoders, like any like complicated things like that, where basically there's networks that are making predictions based on uh, the outputs of other networks, you're going to run into uh, potentially some kind of representation collapse problem, right? Uh, method. We now describe the proposed image-based joint embedding predictive architecture illustrated in figure 3. The overall objective is as follows. Given a context block, predict the representations of various target blocks in the same image. We use a vision transformer architecture for the context encoder, target encoder, and predictor. So three different VITs. A VIT is composed of a stack of transformer layers, each consisting of a self-attention operation followed by a fully connected MLP. Uh, vision transformer. Let's get a little picture of a vision transformer here. What's a good picture? This is a good picture. Yeah, I feel like this is a fine picture. So this is kind of a picture that I show all the time for vision transformers, but basically you break up an image into these little patches. You put in those patches as if they were a sentence, and the transformer has basically a transformer attention map. This mechanism called a self-attention mechanism, and what you're doing in that self-attention mechanism is, uh, none of these are necessarily good. Let me find a good pick. Where is the good pick? Yeah, something like this. So here this is a sentence, but uh, in our case it would be image patches. So for example, you have the sequence here. This is actually, this is not even self-attention. This is self-attention. So here you have the same sequence, and then you can see how it's paying attention to itself. Every element, every token in this sequence has some attention score with every other element in the sequence, right? So that is self-attention, and transformers are based on this whole idea of self-attention. And in vision transformers, you're doing the same thing, except you're, you're doing it with these little image patches. So different parts of the image are paying attention to other parts of the image, right? Uh, okay. Our, and then uh, usually the way that transformer uh, models are uh, laid out, let's look at the trans or attention is all you need paper. Yeah, so generally the way that these work is you basically have a multi-head attention here. This is where the self-attention goes in, and then you have these uh, feed forward here. This block is a multi-layer perceptron, which is what they're talking about here, an MLP, fully connected MLP. That's what this blue brick is, and then the uh, self-attention here is what this uh, orange brick is, right? And actually here in, the, in this particular... Uh, uh, diagram you have a encoder and then a decoder where the decoder has the uh, uh, cross attention right here and this is self attention okay uh, reminiscent of the generative masked autoencoders method however one key difference is that is non-generative and the predictions are made in representation space Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I still think you're generating a representation, so I think it depends on what your definition of generative is, right? Because, like, the you're still generating something, right? You're generating a representation, and then you're just comparing that representation. So maybe it depends on what they say, right? You see here how what, what they call generative is because this decoder is generating Y hat, which is of the same uh, modality, as Y. So if Y is a image space, then Y hat is also image space. So this decoder is generating an output in image space. But here, uh, they're not generating in image space, they're generating an S hat Y, which is a representation, a latent uh, representation of Y. And then they're comparing the actual S Y with the S hat Y here. Uh, okay, let's look at this figure three. The image-based joint embedding predictive architecture uses, uses a single context block to predict the representations of various target blocks originating from the same image. 
various target blocks. I think that's what these little, this blue square, this red square, and this yellow square are. So one thing that I'm immediately noticing here is that they're different sizes, right? So if you notice that, the blue and the red square are two by two, but then this yellow square is one by two. So that's letting me know something, that the actual target block size is probably going to change. I wonder if they have uh, some preset sizes or if they how they how exactly they choose those uh, the context encoder is a vision transformer context encoder here so this is a vision transformer this f theta is a vision transformer parameterized by variables theta and then here you have the target encoder this is a different vision transformer f theta but you see how this theta here has a little bar on top of it that means that the the model parameters for this uh, VIT are different from the model parameters in this VIT. Uh, uh, okay, the predictor is a narrow VIT that takes in the context out context encoder output and conditioned on positional tokens shown in color, predicts the representations of a target block at a specific location. Okay, so the predictor, which is these three models here, and you see here the G of phi and you see how it's the same in all three of this g of phi g of phi g of phi so this is the same model right they're just showing you uh the same model but with a variety of different inputs but in in practice this is probably done in batches right when you're training but you can this is just one model even though it comes it looks like three different models here it's just one model uh takes the context encoder output conditioned on positional encoded positional tokens shown in color so you see these little tokens here this uh, yellow, red, and blue. So here they just show them as kind of like uh, squares, but positional tokens you, it basically is like a little vector that tells you where in the image or where in the sequence this uh, a particular thing comes from, right? So if you actually look at the attention is all you need, here they're also giving you positional encodings. You see here, positional encoding is getting added to the input right here. Positional encoding is getting added to the input right here. So what is a positional encoding? A positional encoding is basically a number, a vector, right? So basically just think of a little array in your head with little float values that represents where in the image that comes from, right? So it's, it's a way for the neural nets to know where this patch comes from. Uh, okay. The target representations correspond to the outputs of the target encoder, the weights of which are updated at each iteration via exponential moving average of the context encoder weights. Okay, so now we know, now we got another piece of uh, data here. So the target encoder, right, this one here, the weights of which are updated at each iteration via an exponential moving average. Also, sometimes you see this as EMA. So if you see EMA, that's exponential moving average of the context encoder weights. Okay, so... Uh, F theta and F theta bar are actually the same model. So these are actually the same model, but they're the same model at different points in time, right? So basically when you're training this, you're training this across many different GPUs, right? So for example, here they said they train this over uh, whatever, 16 A100 GPUs, where was it? Yeah, 16 A100 GPUs. So in each of those GPUs, you're getting slightly different batches of information that are coming in, which means your gradients are slightly different, which means that the weights of the model are changing differently, right? You're, you're ending up with 16 different slightly models, 16 slightly different models. And what you do is every X amount of time, you take all of those different models, which have slightly diverged a little bit because they've seen slightly different data. You average them, right? That's the exponential moving average, average them. And then that's your new, uh, target encoder and that's it so I mean that's that's fairly simple to understand here it's basically just masked auto encoding but in latent space uh, I guess they're saying generative like they want actual human type of content in the embedding in Jeppa space while being generating isn't useful to humans yeah you can't look at an embedding and know what it means right so that's kind of a lot of times people talk about the black box nature of machine learning and like a huge part of why it's a black box is because if i gave you like this position embedding right 
you you would have no idea what it is like you would you could look at this vector that is a positional encoding and it'd be very difficult for you as a human to understand what the fuck that means you could look at this uh vector here this z vector you could look at the vector this s axis s y to to a human it's just going to look like a bunch of float numbers right you can't really interpret it but that's just the way it rolls right it's like these representations they're not human readable but they can be more or less semantic okay targets we first describe how we produce the targets in the ijepa framework the ijepa ijepa is it ijepa ijepa the targets correspond to the representations of image blocks right so you have little chunks of the image and then each little chunk of an image has some representation and then that's what you're trying to predict that's the target given an input image y and right, we're starting to get some mathematical definitions here we're going to go to green green is the color that i use for math uh definitions convert it into a sequence of n non-overlapping patches so uh, VIT 14 that's telling you the number of patches that's that's where that n is right it's this right here it's the number of patches uh, feed this through the target encoder f theta bar this is the exponential moving average of the context encoder uh, to obtain a corresponding patch level representation sy so sy is some kind of vector uh, you have a set of vectors actually so sy is a set of n different sy's where syk is the representation associated with the kth patch okay so this sy right here is it looks like it's just one vector but there's actually going to be however many vectors there are patches right so each patch is going to be one token and each token is going to end up with one uh, representation one vector to obtain the targets for our loss, we randomly sample M, possibly overlapping blocks from the target representations. So these are the yellow, red, and blue blocks here. Uh, we denote BI, the mask corresponding to the ith block. I don't like this because it means that they have to keep track of masks. And SI. S Y of I, so the representation at index I or at blocks block I is equal to S Y J, where J is in B I. Okay. Uh, typically, we set M equal to four. So a little unfortunate hyperparameter there. You know, you generally don't want to have random hyperparameters like that, but sample the blocks with a random aspect ratio in the range <laughs> 0 0.75 and 1.5 and a random scale in the range 0 0.15 and 2 so yeah this isn't great and this actually is very reminiscent of uh uh anchor boxes so in a lot of old school uh computer vision object detection Right, you guys have definitely seen images uh, with bounding boxes before, right? Where you basically put a little box over the things. But what a lot of people don't know is that those bounding boxes are actually uh, a hyperparameter, right? Like a human is deciding, basically, there's a prior that's being put in there, which is basically the shape and relative size of these anchor boxes, right? And generally for example you you say okay well there's tall skinny things there's kind of squarish things and then there's kind of more long fat things but that's a prior that you're putting into your model right so you as a human are encoding your prior knowledge in the form of a anchor box right you as a human are encoding your prior knowledge in the form of a specific range of aspect ratios a specific scale and a specific number of uh overlapping blocks so a little bit of hyperparameters there i jeppa is how i say it yeah uh target blocks are obtained by masking the output of the target encoder not the input this distinction is crucial to ensure target representations of a high semantic level <laughs> Uh, 
Recall the goal behind iJappa is to predict the target block representation from a single tar context block. To obtain the context in iJappa, we first sample a single block X from the image with a random scale. I don't like all these numbers. Like, these are just so many hard-coded random numbers here. Hopefully they do an ablation study where they uh, kind of show some justification for choosing these numbers. We, were no B, we denote BX the mask associated with the context block X. Let's make sure that's green. Since the target blocks are sampled independently from the context block, are they though? I bet you your code uses the same random seed for both of them, so they're not. This is something tricky that people don't realize, but in, uh, obviously this is probably Python. And in Python, when you use a random seed, the random seed is very difficult to separate out from, you know what I'm saying? Like if you're using the random seed to sample the block, and then you use the random seed to sample the target, they're not actually independently sampled because that random seed is actually being used by your Python interpreter to give you the random number that you're using for both. So something tricky is that random numbers in computer are never actually really random. And that's something that you need to pay attention to. I think there's different one, uh, machine learning framework that is very good about this is Jax. So Jax, which is basically the successor to TensorFlow has very nuanced, uh, random seed where you basically pass the random seeds into the function. And it's, it's quite good at that, but a lot of people don't, don't pay attention to that. And it turns out that a lot of their things that they think are randomly sampled independently are not actually independent because the uh, random function calls actually end up using the same seed or they use basically the same state that's getting passed forward. Uh, to ensure a non-trivial prediction task, we remove any non-overlapping regions from the context block. Figure four shows examples of various context and target blocks. Next, the mask context block X is fed through the context encoder F theta to obtain a corresponding patch level representation. Okay, so I mean, this is pretty much just a mathematical description of what we see here, where you basically have a patch, right? So a, a block, a brick of the subsection of the image that's being fed through this context encoder. The context encoder, you see here how this red part of the image corresponds to these four patches. Those are the four patches there. And then this part of the image is only this six patches. So what the predictor is trying to say is it's trying to predict the, the four uh, tokens or the four representations here in these four bricks right here. But the predictor only has access to these six right here, right? So each you could think of each of these uh, patches as a token. So I'm going to use the word token, but you can also think of them also as representations. So the context encoder here has six representations, which are these six gray bricks, which represent the six tokens here, which represent the six patches here. And using that information along with the positional encodings from this red, it has to predict the four uh, representations here, right? The four representations here. And then because you can go all the way back and get what the actual image was, then you know, okay, well, I'm going to predict four numbers here for, or four representations for these. And those better match the four representations that I get whenever I feed the full image into the target encoder. So that's fundamentally what's happening there. Uh, what kind of issues could that cause if it's using the same seed versus if it independently set of different seeds? Uh, it's not like going to be a huge issue. Like it's only really more of an issue if you're doing hyperparameter sweeps and you're sweeping over, right? But it's not, it's not like a huge deal because your computer is hopefully, you know what I'm saying? Like the whole, the random uh, number generators are supposed to be random. So like, even though they're not really random and usually what they're doing is they're like using your clock to look at a specific little thing and then using that thing to get the next thing and then the next thing and the next thing. 
it's it's not that bad. I'm, I guess I'm overstating the fact that they're not independent. They're effectively independent. Uh, okay, prediction. Given the output of the context encoder SX, we wish to predict the M target block representations SY1 all the way to M. Okay, so there's four of them, they said. To that end, we give for a given target block SYI corresponding to a target mask BI, the predictor G phi takes as input the output of the context encoder SX and a mask token for each patch we wish to predict. M, J, J, and B, I, where B, I is the set of all the masks, or where B, I is the mask, and outputs a patch level prediction, S hat, Y, I equals S hat, Y, I, and both of those in the mask. So, I mean, this is just literally this. This picture is that, but way cleaner. Right, so here's the representations. Here's basically the mask is the fact that you know that the rest of this is masked, and the predictor is trying to produce these representations here, which should match this representation here, right? And the L2 here, I think, is kind of teasing an L2 loss, right? Which is basically just a distance metric. Uh, the masks are parameterized by a shared learnable vector with an added positional embeddings. So the positional embeddings are there to tell the uh, predictor where the uh, representations are coming from. Since we wish to make predictions for M target blocks, we apply our predictor M times each time conditioning on the mass tokens corresponding to the target block locations we wish to predict and obtain predictions. So now that you have your predictions, uh, you know what the actual tokens are, right? You do know what the target block representations are here. So S, Y, 1 through M, and then S hat, Y, 1 through M. So you're basically going to do an L2 loss. L2 distance between the predicted level patch representations. So this is like the simplest loss. I guess not. I guess L1 loss is simpler, but the L2 loss is very, I like that. You know, it's a very simple loss. It's basically saying, hey, what's the distance between S hat Y1 and S, S Y1? What's the difference between S hat Y2 and S Y2, right? What's the difference between S hat Y3 and S Y3? So you're basically just subtracting the prediction minus the target you're squaring it. You see this. The double lines mean a uh, distance or a basically a difference, absolute difference. And then squared makes means that things that are close together don't get penalized as much as things that are farther apart. Here you're summing over all masks, over over the entire mask bi. Right, bi is the mask associated with the context block, and then you're also summing over all the uh, blocks. So they said that there's four blocks here in the picture. They show three blocks, but the actual uh, number of blocks is four, and then they average. So they divide by the number of blocks. Uh, yeah, and then basically you see this D here that they uh, use in some of the earlier figures. The D is basically just a distance metric, which here they're telling you is the L2 distance. The parameters of the predictor and the context encoder are learned through gradient-based optimization. While the parameters of the target encoder are updated via exponential moving average of the context encoder parameters. So once you actually get this loss here, you're using this loss to push gradients into the predictor and then also push gradients into this context encoder. And then after X amount of training steps, you're going to take the context encoders, you're going to have a couple different of them because you're training them across a, a bunch of different GPUs with slightly different batches. And then you're going to take the average of all of those context encoders, and that's going to be your new target encoder. And then you repeat the process. So this, the exponential moving average is kind of a form of regularization. So that's another way to think of, about what EMA is doing. So M is the number of blocks. Yes, it is. Uh, the use of exponential moving average target encoder has proven essential for training GEAs with vision transformers. Yes, it's a very good regularizer, especially if you're going to use a super simple loss like L2 distance here. I like this, though. You know, I like very simple losses. I don't like losses that have like 10 different terms in them. Like, I'm, I'm very much appreciating the complexity or the lack of complexity in this paper. It's a very simple technique with a very simple approach and a very simple loss. 
and it works well. You know, that's that's exactly what you want to see. A long line of work has expo explored visual ex representation learning by predicting the values of missing or corrupted sensory inputs, self-supervised learning. Denoising autoencoders, these are encoders that remove the noise, use random noise as input corruption. Context encoders regress an entire image region based on its surroundings. Other works cast image colorization as a denoising task. So different ways of basically removing information from an image, but removing information in such a way that you know what information you've removed. So you can basically then create a self-supervised task where you can re-add that information. The idea of image denoising has recently been revisited in the context of masked image modeling, where a vision transformer is used to reconstruct missing input patches. The work on masked autoencoders proposed an efficient architecture that only requires the encoder to process visible input patches. By reconstructing miss missing patches, MAE achieves strong performance when fine-tuned end-to-end on large label datasets and exhibits good scaling properties. BEIT, what is this? BERT, BERT pre-training of image transformers. Sounds kind of cool. Let's get back up here. Uh, specifically, tokenizing image patches using a frozen discrete VAE. So this kind of sounds like the locked image tuning paper that we read where basically you are freezing one of the encoders uh, pixel level pre-training has been shown to outperform BEIT for fine tuning. SIM MIM explores reconstruction targets based on classic histogram of gradients. This is a very old school technique. I actually really like the visualizations for this. Let me see. Histogram of gradients. Yeah. So this is how people used to detect uh, humans. So it used to be the case that whenever you were doing human detection in images, you basically used these histogram of gradients, right? Because when you look at uh, a gradient is basically, think of it like an edge. It's similar to an edge, but it's basically like whenever the pixels in the image go from being maybe very dark to very light or very light to very dark, or there's like some kind of like transition in the, in the visual appearance of the image, right? And if you actually look at the way that those edges are aligned, most of the time humans uh, have this kind of characteristic, kind of like almost like a shape, right? So the way that people used to do faces were also with this, right? You see this hog and you see how at every single point, there's a bunch of lines. Basically for every single point, you're calculating all the gradients at every single angle and then some of those are going to be the dominant ones and that's going to tell you the uh that's basically like a feature it's a handcrafted feature that people used to use in computer vision but nobody really uses that anymore because the features are just designed yeah this is a this is a good here you go image gradients key point descriptor okay i'll stop talking about ancient computer vision here <laughs> Uh, and demonstrate some advantage over pixel space different from those networks our representation spaces learned during training through a joint embedding predictive architecture our goal is to learn semantic representations that do not require extensive fine tuning on downstream tasks closest to our work is data to vec and context autoencoders data to vec learns to predict the representation of missing patches computed through an online target encoder uh, okay avoiding handcrafted augmentations Context autoencoders use an encoder-decoder optimized via the sum of a reconstruction loss and an alignment constraint. Yeah, and I think this is part of the problem too, is that whenever you're doing things in image space, right, you have these like reconstruction losses and these reconstruction losses are very difficult to get right because a lot of times you can't just take the L2 distance between uh, two images in image space and get something necessarily meaningful there. It's going to be kind of a weird... Uh, distance metric so L2 loss in uh, representation space I think is a better uh, loss than a reconstruction loss in image space uh, iJEPA exhibits significant improvements in computational efficiency and learns more semantic off-the-shelf representations 
Uh, we also compare iJepa with various methods based on joint embedding architectures. So here, Dino is another Facebook AI research paper. Uh, MSN uses masking as an additional data augmentation. iBot combines data to vec style. Common to these approaches is the need to process multiple user-generated views of each input image, thereby hindering scalability. We, we find that a VIT huge 14 requires less computational effort than a VIT small 16 trained with iBot. Yeah, this technique seems to be very computationally efficient, right? They're, they keep talking about that. Uh, okay, so let's look at their results here. They have table one ImageNet, linear evaluation on ImageNet 1K. So ImageNet 1K is a classification uh, task with 1,000 categories. Uh, the images are 448 by 448, which is actually quite kind of a big image resolution, right? A lot of classification tasks are usually much smaller. It's like 224 by 224 or even MNIST, which is like 28 by 28. But uh, this is a slightly bigger image here. Uh, improves linear probing performance compared to other methods that do not rely Generates good scalability, catches the matches the performance of view invariance approaches without requiring view data augmentations. Okay. So here we have different techniques. We have data to VEC, MAE, CAE, and then the iJEPA. Number of epochs. So this is basically you could think of this as how many t the the duration of the training, right? So a lot more epochs means it trained for a lot longer. And here's your top one score. So I mean these are eh, these are on par. I don't think these are amazing. Like 81% is impressive compared to something like is it really though? 81 to 77 is that a huge difference? It seems like it's a little bit better, but the the I think the main takeaway is that not only is it a little bit better, but it's also a lot faster. I think that is what's hard, right? It's not hard to make something that's a little bit better. What's hard is to make something that's a little bit better, but also significantly faster. So the combination of both better and faster is what's impressive here. Here they have different sizes of vision transformers. Uh, ImageNet 1%, semi-supervised evaluation on ImageNet 1K using only 1% of the available labels. So semi-supervised means that it's somewhere in between supervised learning and then self-supervised learning. So in self-supervised learning, you have zero labels, right? You're, you don't have any labels. You're just creating your own labels by using something like masking or any of these kind of like self-supervised training objectives. In fully supervised learning, you have all the labels, all your images are labeled. So here they have a semi-supervised version of ImageNet where only 1% of the images are labeled, right? Models are adapted via fine tuning, depending on whichever works best for each respective method. Uh, Pre-trained, blah, blah blah, does not rely on handcrafted augmentations. They keep mentioning this, but like, I don't know. Somebody needs to make a version of this where they use data augmentation, and then maybe it works better. You know, maybe that's what they're setting up, right? Like, some of these papers, it's like this paper here. I'm sure these authors, right? They're thinking about, okay, well, what are we going to work on next? And they're like, okay, well, why don't we just do exactly what we did here, but we just use a ton of data augmentation and it'll probably work better. Um, but I think part of the reason why this is faster is because data augmentation actually is expensive, right? So generally you're doing data augmentation uh, on the fly. So every time a batch of images is loaded, you're doing data augmentation on those images and then you're training with them, right? You're generally not doing data augmentation beforehand because that'll just explode the amount, the size of your data set, right? If you have to store uh, a left right version of every single image and then a cropped version of every single image. So not having to do data augmentation is actually low key, a pretty good idea for reducing the total computational complexity and the total training time. So I actually do kind of think that maybe that's why they're kind of pushing for it. Uh, a VITH trainer resolution surpasses previous methods, uh, image classification. Okay. So this is basically the two figures that we saw. Uh, linear probing, partial fine tuning. We consider self-supervised models that have been trained on the ImageNet 1K. Uh, after self-supervised pre-training the models, 
weights are frozen and a linear classifier is trained on top. This is a very common way of doing a uh, transfer learning where basically you'll take uh, your model. It's a training a new model head. <laughs> uh, CNN model. Let me just use this. Yeah, so basically you could think of this, this is a ConfNet, but you think of there's there's a layer here. The very last layer is sometimes also called the head. This is a better picture. There's a better picture here. So here you have this part of the model. This entire thing is one model, but this part of the model is sometimes called the base or the encoder, right? And then this part of the model is sometimes called the head, right? which is basically just a little multi-layer perceptron, right? Multiple layers and they're all fully connected. So a lot of times when you're taking a vision model that's been pre-trained and then transferring it into a new task, what you're doing is you're freezing the bottom part here. So in this, this encoder, this base model here, you're actually taking the model that you learned from this pre-training task, you're putting it there, you're freezing it, then you're adding a new head, so you're putting a new head that's initialized at zero and little little MLP, you're putting it there and you're training just that little head. So that's what they mean here by the model weights are frozen and a linear classifier is trained on top. This is the little linear classifier, also called the model head. Uh, compared to popular methods such as masked autoencoders, uh, context autoencoders and data to vec, which also do not rely on extensive handcrafted data augmentation. <laughs> How many times have they said this? Then you stop saying that. Uh, while using less computational efforts, by leveraging improved efficiency, we can train larger models that outperform the best models. Uh, low shot, ImageNet 1K. So zero shot is whenever you basically uh, take a model that's been pre-trained and then zero shot without with zero fine tuning, zero additional training. You basically try to get it to predict uh, on a new task. Uh, one shot is they basically get one shot and then low shot means a low amount of shot. So <laughs> there's no formal definition for that. Uh, here's the idea is to adapt a pre-trained model for ImageNet using only 1% corresponding to roughly 12 or 13 images. So really it's a uh, 12 shot or 13 shot is what they should have said. Models are adapted via fine tuning or linear probing depending on whichever works best for each respective method. IJEPA outperforms while requiring less pre-training epochs. Uh, matches the performance using significantly less computational effort. I'd be really curious to see, there you go, they mentioned that again, but like, I, I'd be curious to see if someone did a profiling on the actual uh, training process and how much of the time is actually being spent on data augmentations. Right? Is it 10%? Is it 2%? Is it 30%? Right? Because that could actually be a, I feel like actually that's, that might even be the reason why they, they it's faster. It's just literally because they don't have these data augmentations. I wish they like told us how much time is spent on these data augmentations. Uh, shows performance on various downstream image classification tasks. Significantly outperformed. I don't know about significantly. I think it's like slightly better. Let's see. Uh, IJEPA, MAE, and data to vec Actually, this is pretty. This is pretty good. Twenty-eight to forty-seven. That's next level. But here, fifty-five to fifty-seven. Fifty-seven to sixty. These are pretty much on par and this is also more patches I think VITB and L, I think is B bigger than L VIT sizes uh, no L is bigger so VIT is VIT base VIT large so VIT large is actually 307 million parameters versus 86 million parameters so this is a smaller model than this one. This is a bigger model. 
So yeah, I mean, it's like comparable, right? This is a slightly bigger model and it gets slightly better performance, but here they're using a slightly smaller model and it gets about the same performance, but they don't use any data augmentation. So it is a little bit faster. So I don't know, it seems like it's pretty good, but it's not like, it's not significantly outperforms. Uh, surpassing popular Dino on CIFAR. These are different data sets or different benchmarks. CIFAR 100. CIFAR is actually kind of like the worst one IMO. It's basically these very tiny little uh, CIFAR image classification. Yeah, like these are so bad. Anytime you see CIFAR, it's effectively MNIST, you know what I'm saying? Like it's it's these like extremely grainy, shitty little pictures that are like, like look how, look how trash these are, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know, CIFAR 10 is low key trash is I guess what I'm saying. Um, But it's fast because it's tiny, so that's why people use it. Uh, view and variant methods, uh, blah, blah, blah. Shows performance on various low-level tasks after pre-training the encoder weights are frozen and the linear model is trained on top. So they're doing another kind of uh, freeze and then cut off the head and retrain a head situation. Uh, method effectively captures low-level image features during pre-training and outperforms them in object counting. Okay, so this is like a kind of a counting task. Clever count and then clever dist. What is clever dist? Clever dist is depth prediction. And then clever count is counting. We don't really have a I good idea of what the fuck this score is. It's probably some kind of accuracy based on this, but what does accuracy and counting mean? Right? Like how much do you penalize big differences versus small differences? Let's actually look at this clever count. I want to get an idea of like what this data set looks like. Oh, it's this shit. Okay. I remember this shit. Yeah. These were popular for a while. There was basically, this is a synthetic data set that someone created uh, where basically you have these different objects that have different properties such as shiny and matte and they like, basically you can infinitely generate these and because you know the exact represent, the exact positioning of all of these because it's a synthetic data set, you can basically infinitely generate uh, uh, labeled examples and here I guess they're doing counting but you can there's all kinds of weird uh, tasks that people have done with this they this is also done for visual reasoning where it's like uh, how many of these objects are red or like is the green object left most to the red object right so actually clever has been used I have seen clever for a bunch of uh, work uh, so yeah okay that's what clever is, is basically counting the red things or counting green things or counting shiny things. Uh, model efficiency. iJEPA is highly scalable compared to previous approaches. Shows semi-supervised evaluation as a function of GPU hours, figure five. Yeah, so this is kind of the, this is basically the exact figure at the very beginning of the paper obtains a significant speed up by requiring fewer pre-training epochs uh, compared to reconstruction based methods such as MAE which directly use pixels iJEPA introduces extra overhead by computing targets in representation space however since iJEPA converges in roughly five times, we see significant compute savings in practice. Yeah, so this is this is kind of, I think, interesting to think about, where whenever you're doing uh, here, right? So this paper is doing joint embedding predictive architecture, right? And there's extra steps here, right? If you're going to have a distance metric here, D, S hat Y, of, and S Y, that is based on a latent or embedding space, you now have to spend extra inference to actually run this predictor model and run this encoder model and run this encoder model, right? If you were just doing it directly in image space, right? Maybe your D here is a reconstruction loss between the generated image and this image. 
you don't have to run this encoder, right? You don't have to, you, you, you save some amount of inference by not having to encode the image, right? But the problem is that predicting in image space, this decoder is gonna be more uh, computationally intensive than this predictor. And then the distance metric here, the reconstruction loss is also gonna be more expensive than this uh, L2 distance here between two vectors. So even though you're doing more uh, inference here and there's more models that you have to basically compute the inference for, the models here are going to be bigger and the distance metrics here are going to be more expensive to compute. So there's kind of like a little bit of a non-intuitiveness where by adding more models and adding more inference, you're actually reducing the total amount of compute. So that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, since iJAPA converges, we'll see significant compute, compute savings. Uh, blah, 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 less compute than a smile iBot model. Here you have ImageNet 1K, 22K, different sizes of transformers, different data sets. This is just kind of showing you the uh, data set and model size. So kind of this is sometimes also called the scaling law chart, right? So sometimes it's convenient to know like how, what is the scaling law like, right? So what I'm looking at here is that, okay, you go from small data set to slightly bigger data set. And there you go, small data set to slightly bigger data set, you get a performance improvement there. But then you go from a small model to big model and you actually see it doesn't change at all. So that's an interesting pattern there, right? So you can basically, these three rows here are pretty good at telling you how much of a impact is the data set size having versus how much of an impact is the model size having. So here's the model size. You know, a little, little bit better, a little bit better, actually a little worse, and then here a little worse as well. Versus data set size, right? So ImageNet 1K versus ImageNet 22K. This one does a little bit better. This one does a little bit worse. This one does more better. This one does more better. This one does more better. So this is a pretty good little chart. When increasing the size of the pre-training data set, we see a performance improvement. We observe further performance improvement by training a larger model. Yeah, so generally bigger model and bigger data set are going to lead to better performance, but not necessarily. And sometimes that that uh, scaling law that isn't isn't perfect. You know, sometimes you lose a little bit of performance by getting a little bit bigger, because there's dynamics that are happening here, right? There's a relationship between the size of the model and the size of the data set, and that goes back to the fundamental properties of any kind of learning algorithm where you basically have this trade-off between underfitting and overfitting and generalization. And sometimes with big models and small data sets, you overfit. Sometimes it's better to have a small model that has less capacity so it can't overfit to the data set. So there's kind of weird dependencies there, but in general, bigger data set is better, bigger model is better. Uh, scaling model size significantly improves, blah, blah, blah. Okay, maybe they're saying that there's probably some kind of weird relationship here where in these different uh, transformers here, this, the number of the patches changes. So you see how here the, the smaller VITH has 14 versus 16, right? So the patches are these things. So they're saying that there's probably some weird relationship there where the the number of patches and the relative size of the patches also is like in, in some way impacting the performance. Uh, predictor, the role of the predictor is to take the output and condition on the positional mass tokens to predict the representation of a target black. This should be block. There's a little typo there of a target block at the location specified by the mass tokens. One natural question is whether to whether the predictor condition on the positional mass tokens is learning to correctly capture positional uncertainty in the target. To qualitatively investigate this question, we visualize the outputs of the predictor. We use the following visualization approach to enable research community to independently reproduce our findings. After pre-training, we freeze the context encoder and predictor weights and train decoder following the RCDM framework to map the average pool of the predictor outputs back to pixel space. 
uh, shows decoder outputs for various random seeds. Qualities that are common across samples represent information that is contained in the average pooled predictor. Representation correctly captures positional uncertainty, produces high-level object parts with the correct pose. You know why? I can't. I can't think. I gotta. I gotta give them the. Let's do it. I gotta provide a service to the community. I'm like the only motherfucker here who is like reading uh, the paper enough to actually catch typos. So let's do this. Let's give them the typo. Let's go onto their thing. Create a new issue. Typo in paper. It's just my OCD, you know? I have like pretty bad OCD and I just need to tell people when there's typos. There, This should probably be target block. Great work. But you know, you don't wanna come off as like an absolutely insane OCD person, so you, you give them a little positive reinforcement to let them know that you're chill. Uh, okay, back to the paper. Okay, so what are we doing here? We're doing an ablation study, and they're in this ablation study, they're going to investigate the question of whether the positional mask tokens are correctly capturing positional uncertainty. Okay, so if you remember uh, here, the predictor, it's not only is it receiving these uh, uh, embedding, these representations coming from specific patches of the image, but it's also receiving positional uh, embeddings and a mask, uh, a representation of the mask. BI is the mask corresponding to the ith block. So they're trying to say, okay, well, these positional embeddings and mask information, like, how, how what is that? What is, what is, what is, co what is coming from that, right? That's kind of what they're trying to answer here. Uh, and then figure six is what that is. Okay. So visualization of iJEPA predictor representations. For each image, the first column contains the original image. So this is the original image. Second column contains the context image. Okay. So the image that has been masked, which is processed by pre-trained VIT encoder. Green bounding boxes in subsequent columns contain samples from a generative model decoding the output of a pre-trained iJEPA predictor. So if you look at this image, right, why is there multiple pieces missing like this? Well, the reason that there's multiple pieces missing is because they have four different M's, right? If you remember, they have four different blocks. So all the blocks are being run at the same time. So they're they're cutting out four random parts of the image every time, right? So that's what you're seeing here is they're cutting out four different blocks. And you see how it's, it's a sl it's slightly different four blocks every time. And then you're basically seeing the uh, predictor creating the representation of what should be here and then that representation being uh, generated in the image space. So you can see here how it generates the back of this bird. This one is actually pretty bad. This one seems fine. That one seems fine. But even here, right? So they, they keep talking about priors and like not wanting to put priors. But when I look at these masks, don't you think... Uh, it would actually be better if you had an object centric prior for the choice of these positions of the mask, right? Like one very common prior in images is that images tend to be centered on an object. There tends to be like, you could say that the center of an image is generally more important than the edges of an image, right? So if that's the case, maybe you should bias the selection of these mask uh, blocks such that they tend to be more so in the center of the image rather than in the corner of the image, such as the one up here, right? So I feel like they talk a lot about not wanting to put priors in here, but I feel like I see a lot of opportunities where they could put priors and it could be better performance. Uh, the burger one seems a little bit weirder. I don't feel like any of these are good. Uh, what's the difference between left and right? Let's see. Uh, conditioned 
qualities that are common. The IJF predictor is correctly capturing. What is the difference between left and right here? There is no difference, it's just, okay. So I think this is just eight examples, but it's not like there's with something, without something. I thought this was like an, ab an ablation kind of study, and I figured maybe they were feeding the position encoding and then no position encoding, but that's not the case. All of these are calculated using the same method, it seems. Yeah, they're just kind of just showing you examples. That's lame. I would have liked to see this figure, but like with positional encodings and mask information and then without positional encodings and mask information, just to show you qualitatively how much it's actually adding. Uh, compares using a linear probe when the loss is computed in pixel space versus representation space. Uh, so that's that D function, right? It's Is the D function an L2 loss between two representations or embeddings? Or is the D function a uh, reconstruction loss between two images? And even the reconstruction loss between two images, there's like a, a million different ways to take that, right? There's people that, uh, the way that they do reconstruction losses, they basically feed it into an inception model and then do the distance there. There's reconstruction losses for images. Yeah, perceptual losses as I guess another family of reconstruction losses. L2, L1, those are bad. Generally there's like more cool ones. Is there anyone here? No, okay, never mind. I'm not gonna find a cool uh, image space loss. Uh, we conjecture that the crucial component is that the loss is computed entirely in image representation space, giving the target encoder the ability to produce abstract prediction targets which for which relevant pixel level details are eliminated. Right, so this is their whole high semantic versus low semantic. So in their terminology, something that has low semantic uh, representation is a representation where a lot of the capacity is being used to store pixel level details like texture and color and uh, appearance basically versus something that is highly semantic in their terminology is something where uh, the capacity is not being used to to store these uh, quote unquote irrelevant pixel details. I don't know if they're irrelevant. Some people might say they are more relevant, right? If you want a very consistent visual style, then pixel level details are important. But if you care more about the semantic uh, concept behind an image, then you don't really care about the pixel level details. Uh, but in this case, because what they're they're talking about here, the the benchmarks that they're using are these classification benchmarks. So I feel like, yeah, it kind of makes sense that more semantic, more effort being put into the semantic uh, information is better than into the pixel information. So. They're kind of picking the right benchmark to uh, argue for their technique. Images split into four large quadrants. Context to predict the other quadrants. In the block masking. In random masking, the target is set of random patches and the context is the image complement. There is no overlap between the context and the target blocks. We find multi-block masking to be helpful for guiding iJEPA for learning semantic representations. Okay, so there's different types of masking here. It's basically seeming you have multi-block, rasterized, block, and random. In rasterized, the image is split, the image is split into four quadrants and then one quadrant is used to predict the other quadrants. In block, so anytime you see the word rasterize, generally that means basically this, almost like uh, you're going across, right? Rasterization. I feel like none of these are good examples of rasterization, but 
you know, their definition is cleaner here. Split into four quadrant and then use the quadrant to predict the other ones. In block masking, the target is a single image block and the context is image com complement. The fuck is the image complement? And then in random, I guess the, the missing part of the image, so everything but what's been masked. And then in random masking, the target is a set of random image patches and the context is the image complement. Okay, so then random is basically the opposite of that. And then in multi-block, I wish they had pictures of this. You know, that would be easier to, to tell, but they don't. You just have to kind of like visualize in your head what each of these different blocking strategies look like. But it actually does seem to make a huge difference. Like look at this, 54% compared to 15, 20, and 17. So this is some of the biggest differences we've seen in this paper. So multi-block seems like the most important part. So target versus context here, this is the if you go back to the original figure here, the target is this, and then the context is this. So the context is what you're giving to the predictor in order to generate the representations, which are then used uh, to, with a L2 loss, to compare to the representations that are produced from the actual target, which is the full image. Uh, cool. Conclusion. We propose iJEPA, a simple and efficient method for learning semantic image representations without relying on handcrafted data augmentations. We show that predicting in representational, re, predicting that by predicting in representation space, iJEPA converges faster than pixel reconstruction methods and learns representations of a high semantic level. In contrast to view invariance-based methods, iJEPA highlights a path for learning general representations with joint embedding architectures without relying on handcrafted view augmentations. Okay, so pretty cool. Let's look at the the extra part here, the appendices. So in the appendices, they're generally gonna give you the more specific numbers, and they're gonna go a little bit more in detail about exactly what they do. They use the vision transformer. The predictor is designed as a lightweight narrow VIT, so slightly different VIT for the predictor and the uh, encoder decoders. Right, the context encoder and the target encoder, these are gonna be the same exact model because the target encoder is the exponential moving average of the context encoders. So these two are gonna have the same exact model architecture, but the predictor is gonna have a slightly different model architecture. Hello, RW, how's the paper? It's a, it's a pretty nice paper, it's very clean, it's very simple. And if I had to TLDR it, it's basically just masked autoencoding in the uh, latent space. So it's basically just the same kind of self-supervised MAE that uh, Facebook AI research is known for, but now they're doing it in this uh, representation space and that allows them to not use uh, data augmentations, which means that they can do it a lot faster and quicker. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty good. And it's also the way that they wrote it. They, they wrote it so it's not like super image specific. They wrote it with wording such that you could then apply this to audio or any other kind of modality as well. Uh, we use the target encoder. Ooh, so they're, they're actually average pooling in order to create the image representations. Adam W, a little optimizer. This is what's actually doing the gradient descent. These are these are big batch sizes, 2048. That's a big boy batch size right there. Uh, you have a learning rate schedule. You start at a smaller learning rate and then you actually increase the learning rate and then you go down. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. So 
They have a learning rate schedule that starts at 10 to the negative 4, goes up to 10 to the negative 3, and then goes all the way down to 10 to the negative 6. And then cosine scheduling, so uh, cos cosine scheduling goes up and down. All right, sometimes that's also called annealing because annealing is whenever you're like a blacksmith, you'll like heat up a piece of metal and then you'll cool it down. And then you're heated up the piece of metal and then you'll cool it down and then you heat it up and then cool it down. So in blacksmithing, you're doing this kind of like heating, cooling, heating, cooling, heating, cooling. And that up and down, up and down, up and down pattern is effectively what a cosine or a sine is. So a cosine learning rate schedule basically goes up and down and up and down. It changes the learning rate up and down and up and down, which is changing the speed of the little marble as it's moving. So sometimes the learning rate will be high, so the little marble can get out of a little local minima, but then the speed will slow down so it can kind of really get to the bottom of that local minima. Uh, weight decay is linearly increased from 0 0.04 to 0 0.4. Target encoder weights are identical to the context encoder weights at initialization and then updated via the exponential moving average. Uh, so moving average here refers to the fact that there's a momentum. So four possibly overlapping blocks. They don't really tell us where they got these numbers. So unfortunately, you know, we, we were saying that, hey, it'd be great if they tell us how the fuck they got these numbers, but they don't. They're just going to say, hey, we just use these numbers. Hmm. Unfortunate. Uh, they resize CFAR to 224, so that makes CFAR even more shitty. What else? Different learning rates, weight decays, broader related work. Target block size. Oh, here you go. Finally. Okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so they did do ablations where they compared uh, a couple different versions of their weird magic numbers here. Yeah, and these these have a huge difference. Look at this. 54 versus 19 versus 33. So the, the scale, these like weird numbers that they came up with here for like the specific size and shape and aspect ratio of these like uh, blocks is actually incredibly important. Look at this. It's a U-shaped kind of... Uh, plot where like if you make them too big the performance drops if they're too small the performance no good so you don't want to see this right you don't want to see very high sensitivity to hyperparameters that are kind of somewhat arbitrarily chosen so uh, this one seems to be a little bit less important the context size but it's still pretty huge right 31% versus 54% for these slightly different sizes here See, and the, and the way that they made these two tables kind of uh, paints a picture for you. So you see how here the size of the context is 0. Point, the best context is this, and then the best uh, scale is this. So really you would want every possible permutation of this, right? You would want every possible target scale with every possible context scale and then see which one gives you the highest score. But here they're only giving you uh, uh, the score for a bunch of different contacts given the same target scale and then a score for a bunch of different target scales given the same contact scale. So they're kind of like freezing one or the other, which isn't necessarily great. Do you think T Jeppa could be used to augment small models by having the world model inside Jeppa and augmenting a 125 million GPT-2 model? How much more comprehensive do you think it could be? Uh, I don't think this is like a you keep bump up usefulness. You could drastically increase the context size. I don't know if you're. I I think this is just a way a self supervised technique for training encoders, and uh, with the purpose of having an encoder that is kind of a little bit more semantic in the representation space. This isn't really like an augmentation technique. 
But to your point on augmentation, they talk uh, a lot of trash on augmentation here, but I'm pretty sure if they added data augmentation to this paper, it would work even better. Okay, so this is their multi-block masking strategy that also ended up being super important. Predictor depth. So the predictor is just a little six layer model or a 12 layer model. So this is the, the predictor that actually generates the semantic, or not generates, the, the, the predictor that generates the representations Right, so you can make it twice as deep and it only has a little bit increased performance. With and without weight decay, you're getting a little bit of a difference there as well. And then the width of the predictor also making a difference. So I like I like just how good all these this hyperparameter sweep is, you know. Generally a lot of people won't necessarily tell you that, but here they did. we use the RCDM framework. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so I mean, any model that consumes a embedding, that embedding is going to change. So I think, for example, one thing that you see is in a lot of stable diffusion papers or diffusion-based image generation papers, they constantly mention that increasing the size of the text encoder results in significantly better generation quality, right? So size of text encoder in uh, image generation. Uh, I don't even know what paper I'm looking for, but basically what's happening is that whenever you're using in, in something like a, a diffusion model, you're using a text embedding to, con to basically uh, condition the removal of the noise and thus create and generate the image. What a lot of people have noticed is that actually the quality of that text embedding is incredibly important, right? And if you have a very small, shitty text embedding, it's not going to be anywhere near as good as a good, like, pre-trained text embedding. So there's probably uh, uh, science to be done where people, okay, let's take a model or some kind of approach that relies on an image encoder. And instead of using whatever image encoder we were using before, let's use this iJEPA embedding, right? And this iJEPA embedding is supposedly supposed to have a little bit better semantic, it's supposed to be higher semantic meaning than a normal image embedding. So maybe some techniques start working better because of it, you know? Yeah, any technique that requires an image encoder, if you replace it with this image encoder instead, you might see different behavior or might see better behavior, but you might also see worse behavior, it's hard to tell. I feel like this might work well for techniques where you maybe have like views of a different object with different lighting, you know, like something like that. Like I feel like any any kind of approach where you're using an image encoder, but you don't want the image embedding to represent low level image details like like the the lighting or maybe the specific colors and stuff like that. So I would bias towards those type of systems. Yeah. Is this even uh available yeah look at that they do have them that's pretty nice 
So they do have the models here. They have a 448 by 448 model, and then they have uh, 224 by 224 models. These aren't like necessarily huge, but that's good. You know, they release the models. You can use those, see if they're better. A little chicken with two heads. You don't want to see that. Cool. So that's pretty much it, guys. Let's do a summary of this paper. Pause for a second. Think about it. All right. Here's a summary of this paper. So today we read self-supervised learning from Im images with a joint embedding predictive architecture. This was a paper uh, out of Facebook AI research with the help of a couple different uh, academic institutions. Uh, famously, Jan LeCun is on this paper. He's the controversial head of Facebook AI research. So what this paper does is it kind of gives a good uh, kind of summary and intuition around what different types of self-supervised learning are doing, right? It kind of like creates this uh, three different categories which are joint embedding architecture, generative architecture, and joint embedding predictive architecture. This paper, which is iJEPA, is joint predictive, joint embedding predictive architecture. And the idea is basically that uh, you are doing a kind of a masked image task where you're basically, uh, it's self-supervised in the sense that you have an image and then you can chunk out different parts of that image and you know what those are supposed to look like. And they, rather than predicting directly in image space, which is what you would be doing in some of the more, uh, some of the other masked autoencoder tasks that we see out of Facebook, what they're doing in this paper is they're predicting in the embedding or latent space, right? So they're predicting representations and then doing an L2 loss in representation space and using that as the uh, loss to improve this predictor model and then also uh, the encoders here. So these two encoders are actually the same encoder, uh, just one of them is the exponential moving average of this one. Uh, so they argue that this results in representations that have a better semantic uh, meaning and they show that by uh, doing a bunch of uh, ImageNet 1K classification benchmarks and then also some counting and uh, depth prediction benchmarks. And it does seem to be slightly better than other existing image encoders. But I think that the real benefit of this is the simplicity of this. I think that the fact that the loss is literally just an L2 loss that's a huge benefit. The fact that you don't have to do any kind of data augmentation, also a huge benefit because that simplifies the pipeline, simplifies the training process. And I think the biggest win here is not the slight increase in performance, which I think is somewhat negligible. I think the biggest win here is the fact that you can train this significantly faster. I think it's the speed of the training that is better. So they do release the uh, model so you can use them uh, for your research if you have some kind of uh, specific problem where you feel like having a image uh, representation that is a little bit more s semantic and a little bit less uh, kind of pixel textury you know then this could be useful for you um, one thing that I did not like is that it seems like their model is very sensitive to hyperparameters when I look here they were messing with the size of these little blocks and this uh, uh, for the target and the context image, right? So, and it seems like it's very sensitive to that size, right? So that's a little sketchy. I don't like to see the, the kind of like a, a sensitivity to hyperparameters like that. But other than that, you know, I think this is a very good paper. It, it's a very clean, simple concept that seems to work very well. It, it's taking a step towards simplicity and finding better performance there that is also faster. So I don't know, TLDR, I like it. Uh, and that's it, guys. Um, hopefully that was useful. Uh, like and subscribe as always. Join the, you, join the Discord if you want to join the Discord and chat on there. If not, 
see you guys later. Thank you, Creative Builds, RW, uh, Radel, Falcao, everybody else that uh, commented and asked questions. And see you guys tomorrow. I don't know what paper I'll do, but we'll figure it out.